Lucy. He uh, did his PhD uh, in, in Melbourne and then he was moved overseas and has worked in industry for a number of years. And then, uh, after which, about five years ago, he, uh, he returned to, to Australia. He was the prize of the market. And uh, he's been working on many things amongst those uh, interesting topics. Is ultra fast signal characterization on a chip, which you'll speak about now. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, thanks, folks. As, as I say, I'm from Kudos at the School of Physics, University of Sydney. Um, you've heard a lot this week about uh, physics for optical devices, and my, my, check, my, talk, my two talks will mainly be about applications. Um, that, and that's going to tie into the research that's going on in the School of Physics. So the other one in my talk today is going to be, um, this first talk is going to be about ultra-fast science um, technology in particular, how do we, how do we measure these uh, ultra-fast pulses? Um, I might just switch on this one. Let's see. So yeah, um, so the, the two the techniques I'll be talking about today, uh, so we're trying to measure very short um, uh, events, time scale, time scale events. These have very important applications in a wide range of physics and physical sciences. Um, the main technique that I'll talk about is autocorrelation and frequency resolved of the gating. And then the focus of this presentation will really be about what the research we're doing, and that's uh, frequency signal characterization with optical chip devices. And I'll talk about an optical sampling scope with a very high resolution and also a waveform spectrum analyzer. And then um, I'll talk about the application of this potential device for optical performance monitoring in um, real, real systems communications as well. So, ultra-fast objects. So, um, there's, there's a capability to measure extremely, sh to generate extremely short um, um, optical events over the time scale of even nanosecond. Now, nanosecond is uh, 10 to the minus 18 seconds. And this is one example where physicists generated a 320 nanosecond pulse, um, and that was done in Tokyo. And here on the top, we see the electric field of this pulse, and then we see the intensity profile below. So, the electric field we see it only can, the pulse is so short that it only contains a few cycles of the optical carrier frequency. So, with, this, is, this is a very short um, pulse. And on the, on the right, we have an example where we, a pulse was generated from a semiconductor laser, a very small, compact little device that was using some nonlinear compression techniques. And this, this still stands as one of the record short pulses from the semiconductor laser. It's a 20 femtosecond pulse, which, um, which is a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So just to give some perspective about how short that pulse is, if you consider 20 femtoseconds to one second, that's a good one, to one, as that's what one second is to 1.6 million years. So it's a very short event. So how do, how do we, we, can, we can generate such short pulses, but how can we measure, possibly measure such short pulses? And there's, there's traditional, there's a variety of traditional techniques for um, characterizing pulses um, and optical, and we're talking in the optical context. So there's an optical spectrum analyzer, and that's simply this device shown on the left, which is the spectrometer, which basically takes the, the input signal, is, um, it's a grading, and this grading disperses frequent, disperses the light depending on their frequencies at different angles. And so if we have a detector, we can measure which, um, which frequency is what. And so by tuning the angle of this grading, we can tune different frequencies in the detector. And that way we can resolve the full spectrum of the signal. And here's an example of a supercontinuum source um, that was generated and 
This stands from 1,200 nanometers all the way to 2,000 nanometers, nice and flat spectrum. This was measured using a spectrometer. So this spectrum analyzer is nice, but it doesn't give the full information of the pulse here. We only have the, um, the intensity of the spectra components. We lose all the phase information. So from that spectrum, we can't really recover what time domain of this pulse is. So to measure time domain, we can use other technologies. And the common technique is also to use a photo detector, uh, which, at, which from the state of the art, the highest bounds we're looking at is about 65 gigahertz. That's about a six picosecond pulse. That's about as fast as we can get with a photo detector. We can marry that with an electrical spectrum analyzer, which has a bound of 50 gigahertz. But still, when we're dealing with these very short events, um, we're talking about terahertz bands, so that's well beyond the capability of these uh, electronic, optoelectronic solutions. Another example is using a, a so we formed a time domain technique, and then another example is a sampling scope. So that's also limited to about 80 gigabytes, that's with a standard source scope. And there's two ways a, a source scope can work. Can, there's a real time sampling where um, it basically has an electronic gate function that, you now we're talking about a signal that's been converted into an electrical signal. We use, there's a gate function in, that samples the electrical the signal under test, and by having a series of periodic sampling functions, sorry, we can, um, yeah, we can build, build, construct the waveform by sampling this signal. So obviously, if this is a 20 frames per second pulse, and we would have, we'd have to have a sample at much faster rate than the 20 frames per second pulse. And this <coughs> sampling gate must also be much, much narrower than the 20 frames per second pulse. So it's not going to work if we want to try and vision this pulse. Uh, the other example that relaxes the rate of sam the sampling rate is to use what's called equivalent time sampling. This is basically how most sampling source scopes work. They have a very low repetition rate sampling gate. And we assume we're measuring a periodic waveform. So this, um, this waveform we assume doesn't change. And so we can sample different, each, each acquisition cycle will sample a different position of this pulse, but it's periodic. So it's, it's synchronized with the signal so that each acquisition cycle will sample different waveforms. We build up a, a series of samples, put them together, and we get a, we can construct the waveform. But still, this sampling uh, period, this sampling period needs to be much shorter than the pulse itself. So for very short optical signals, we need a different approach. So, and the way that, and the way that enabled that is by using this nonlinear optics. And we consider here, um, the idea is to harness an intensity dependent nonlinearity in a, in a medium. And this is, this is, we've seen this many times, this is using the nonlinear polarization of the medium that's reduced. Um, for an input electric field. We have these higher order terms. Uh, we have a chi 2 and a chi 3 terms. And these, it's these higher order terms that can leave all the um, uh, nonlinear signal processing and characterizing short pulses, which I'll explain. So different varieties of materials can be all different types of materials can be used to take advantage of this nonlinearity. We have chi 2 crystals. Periodically cold, we can nivate optical fiber um, and silicon and chalcogenide. Today I'll be talking about this chalcogenide wafer, which you would have heard already something about. So, um, measuring one of the key techniques, how do we measure a very short pulse? The idea is instead of trying to sample it with a function that's much shorter than the pulse, we use something, we use the pulse itself. That's what we mean is the autocorrelation. The idea is that you have an input pulse, you split it. Into two parts, and here one part is delayed, it has a controllable delay, and then you combine it with itself again, so that what we have, and then it undergoes some mixing in this waveguide here, as shown. And so what we have is this delayed version replica of the pulse combined with the original pulse, and it goes through this mixing element, and there's an intensity, and due to that nonlinearity, we have this generate this second harmonic in this case for this. Chi 2 crystal, we get this uh, the signal, electric field of the signal becomes proportional to the product of these, of the delayed version of the signal and the original signal. And it's really this overlapping part that only contributes to the um, second harmonic signal. 
So here we see that only the tails of the pulse are overlapping, so that corresponds to um, a, low, um, a low intensity. And we measure that on a flow detector, which can be a slow flow detector. And we change the delay. We move along the pop, we move along. Now the, the overlap is increased, so we get a higher intensity. And we can continue going for different delays. And then we can reach peak intensity where the delay in the pulse is sort of aligned, and so on. And so then we, that's how we get the autocorrelation of the function. And different, different materials can be used. It's been shown in using kaiju crystals or now, this is fine, but really the sign gives a blurred picture of the image. If this was an asymmetric pulse, then this autocorrelation function would still appear um, uh, symmetric. So it's not quite um, it's useful. We can, of course, we can measure the pulse. We can infer what the pulse is from the autocorrelation function, but there is some ambiguity if it has um, some complex pulse shape. So we, we can do that in that. And this is a technique that was developed in the 1990s. It's, it's actually not much different from the autocorrelation scheme. The only difference really is that photo detector is now replaced with a spectrometer, which is that device I talked about earlier. And the idea is now that for each um, delay, the, the, uh, the intensity of the, of the electric field is now spectrally resolved. So we get this what's called a spectrum game where we can now generate the frequency as a function of delay and on the y-axis we have intensity, uh, sorry, the z-axis, so the different colors represent different intensities. So, um, and this, this now can be used, so we have all the information of the pulse now, we have the, we have the time and frequency um, profile. And now that enables, through some computer algorithm, it's possible to recover the true electric field and the phase of the pulse. So here's an example here where there's a spectrogram of more complex pulse, and on the right is the reconstructed um, pulse in terms of amplitude and phase. So this is a really powerful technique that's used in all laboratories um, around the world. And it can be it, it can use um Pi2 in PL3 pole we can nine silicon waveguides, and also fiber. So the, the work I'll be focusing on today is about this Chi 3 based um, nonlinear optics. And as I said, that's this Chi 3 term here, and that gives rise to what's called the Kerr effect, where basically the refractive index of the medium changes in proportion to the intensity of the field that's going through this waveguide. There's a proportion to this nonlinear index here, too. And we've done different wave, all different types of waveguides, and in this talk I'll talk about this gel progenite waveguide. And that gives rise to three effects self phase modulation, cross phase modulation, and void mixing, which you've heard already about. So just to give, summarize uh, how this signal processing, just really how all these different types of signal processing based on chi free work, we consider we have, we, it's all about mixing and it's, you know, we're propagating a signal, we're co-propagating with a pump through a wave, through a medium with a chi free nonlinearity. Here we consider the case of kind of a sampling based function. So we have this broad pulse and we're co-propagating with a signal of very short pulses. And um, this is in the frequency domain. We've got this broad, uh, short pulse spectrum we combine with that. And then, so in the case of Fourier mixing, we get the idle wave generator and the wavelength proportional to the difference between the signal and the pump wavelength. Now, if we filter out that idle, then what we have in the time domain is basically a sample function of the signal, sample in the sense that it's now the pump involved with the signal. And alternatively, we can consider now cross-phase modulation, which is the cross-phase modulation is where the um, refractive index of the medium is changing in proportion to the intensity of the pump. And that, that refractive index change translates to change of light, speed of light, which change, translates to a phase change. And so we get frequency modulation of the signal, which appears as a side band on the signal, so we filter out that side band, filter out, use a filter, and we will see when we get a sample version of the signal. So we can get, do the same thing using four and get more cross phase modulation. And it all depends on that phase matching, because now we have all these signals and pumps propagating at different wavelengths that can propagate due to dispersion, they'll be propagating at different velocities, group velocities, and phasing as well. So why are we interested in child project rights? I'm sure what Steve knows for he, he was given a nice presentation about 
all the advantages of child homogenizing. And I'll just briefly summarize them again. Um, the basic idea is that these child homogenized glasses have a very high refractive index. And there's a rule of thumb that the higher refractive index, the higher it's nonlinear index in two. And that's by Miller's rule. And, this, and if you compare the contrast child homogenized glasses to silicon glasses, these are child homogenized here, which contain the elements of sulfur or arsenic and selenium. Um, if we contrast the nonlinear, the linear index and nonlinear index for these child homogenized, we can see that they're about 400 to up to what, three orders of magnitude higher than silica. So that, and we have this very high capability to get a much higher nonlinear response. And that's important because these devices, we want to operate with a low optical power. And um, the higher the nonlinear response, the lower the power we need to operate. So, we, and these, all, these devices are also important that they have low two-quoted absorption, so we, we have a nice pure uh, high linearity and without these nonlinear effects from uh, two-quoted absorption. So, and how these waveguides are fabricated, this is a structure of a typical planar waveguide that um, Steve would have shown. It's a, we have an arsenic trisulfide um, film deposited on a silicon silicon substrate, which will and this has um, reduced by thermal um, evaporation deposition. And then by photography and dry etching, we can etch out these root waveguides uh, into the, um, this uh, child hydrogenite. And more details are given in these references here. So but we, we can do better than that. More than just the high nonlinear index of the material, we can also enhance the nonlinearity by other means, and that's mainly by Take advantage. This is the nonlinear uh, coefficient of a waveguide which we can use for any Chi 3 material. And the basic parameters that define how high this nonlinear coefficient is is it's, in, non, it's proportional to the nonlinear index and also inversely proportional to the effective area of the waveguide. Now, the effective area of the waveguide we can think of here, we can compare with a silica a standard with a silica fiber. And a multimode fiber. A multimode fiber has a, a core diameter of about 50 micron. Compare that with a silica fiber, which has a core diameter, a much smaller core diameter of 9 micron. Its effective area is about 75 micron square. Now, basically, if we can confine light to a tighter and smaller and smaller area, we'll, we'll concentrate the light more and we'll, get, we'll increase the nonlinear effects. There's different ways to do that in fibers. The fibers we can take it. In silica fibers, there is not much index contrast between the core and clay, it's only a fraction of a percent. So we can't just arbitrarily make the core smaller and smaller to, to find the light more and more because the, the field will just spread out. There's not enough index contrast to really tight confine that mode in this smaller core. So there are tricks. So this is an example of a poly fiber, what's called where there's um, air holes all around the all around the glass core. And that air, the refractive index air is much lower than the refractive index of the glass, silicon glass, so it's 1.5 compared to 1. So that can that provides an extra degree to confine to make this confine, to increase this confinement and boost the nonlinear coefficient by reducing this effective area. There are other ways, even like tapering the fiber. Here's an example, basically just pulling the fiber, stretching it out. This is an example showing tapering the silicon fiber down to a half a micron. This is an image here, and it's not quite clear that there's actually a half a micron fiber there. And that's basically we get we narrow, we reduce the, the fiber down to a 500 nanometer width. Now the core is much smaller, it's of course scales with that. But now the core, the guiding is not now by the core and the cladding, the guiding is now in the air, in the, um, by the air and the, and the cladding itself. So yeah, but the difference with now this chalcogenide waveguide is now we're guided, we've got this high index um, chalcogenide glass and we're really guided by the um, refractive index of this glass is about 2.38 compared to the polymer on top, which is about 1.53, and the silicon silicon dioxide, the silicon layer on the below is, is 1.44. So we can now make this crunch this dimension down, we can still keep the light guided. So we can do two things. So we can enhance nonlinearity by um, designing the, the 
the dimensions of this waveguide to make it smaller and smaller. We can, but that also enables another key advantage, and that's controlling the dispersion of these waveguides. Now, dispersion is really the refractive index variation of material as a function of wavelength. And here, here's a plot of um, variation for silica fiber. And of course, the speed of light is determined by the, the loss, the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the refractive index of the material. So here we're going to see that the, the speed of light in, in fiber will vary strongly with wavelength. That's what gives rise to what's called material dispersion. Every material will have a different profile for such a for their uh, different material dispersion. There's also another effect, and that's the waveguide dispersion. And that's, now here we can see the cross-section of the cladding and the core. And the core. Now, really, by total internal reflection, all the, all the field is not quite contained within the core. It's actually, it has this kind of direct Gaussian kind of distribution, so there's tails of the field actually propagate in the cladding of the fiber. So now the refractive index of the core and the cladding are different, but the core is higher for total internal reflection. So these tails are propagating in a, you know, you know, a glass with a lower refractive index. So there's going to be a, diff a different speed, they're traveling at a different speed, that gives rise to what's called wavelength dispersion. And that's also wavelength dependent. As we, as we go to longer wavelengths, um, that will be just you now the field, the field distribution spreads further and further into the cladding and that will increase the waveguide dispersion. So when we combine those two effects together, we get um, material, combine the material dispersion and the waveguide dispersion, we can engineer the top overall dispersion properties of the material. Here's an example here where um, this is for the standard fiber, where we have waveguide dispersion as such, we have a negative dispersion parameter. And then we have the material dispersion shown on the dark line. Combine them together, we get this overall total dispersion. And we can do the same thing with these child waveguides. wave guides. Uh, we've got material dispersion, which is shown here on the green as a function of wavelength. And then we've, now we've, we've combined the mode to the point where the, the mode field is now spread. This is a TM mode, transverse magnetic mode. We have a lot of the modes spread out in, into the cladding with very low refractive index compared to the passing child sulfide core. So we have uh, quite a, we're going to have a strong waveguide dispersion term, and that's when we combine that with the material dispersion shown in green, we get the total dispersion shown in blue. So we engineer the dimensions, to design these dimensions carefully so that we can shift this dispersion from a very large negative value to up to the zero, um, close to zero, 15, 15 nanometers, which is where we're going to operate. And we, so we have, and in doing that, we've also, by these small dimensions, we've enhanced the nonlinearity coefficient to 10,000 per watt per kilometer. That's about 5,000 times standard fiber. So that's so that low dispersion is um, is a band, is is important if we want to have a broadband device which we can use for very short um, pulses, which is what our key application is for characterizing short pulses. And the key parameter for measuring how, um, how, how much a pulse will dispersion is its pulse dispersion rate. And that's basically as a function of, depends on the initial pulse width, scales to the square of the pulse width, and it's a version of the pulse width to the dispersion of the waveguide. If we plug in the numbers for that child waveguide waveguard that I mentioned, then we can see that if we have a six centimeter waveguide, the minimum pulse width uh, that will Avoid significant dispersion is about 81 femtoseconds. That's at 50, 50 nanometers. So we can expect that we can propagate very short pulses, 200 femtosecond pulses, and we shouldn't see much dispersion. And so we, we did an experiment in the lab with that. And here we had a femtosecond pulse source, which was generating 260 femtosecond pulses. And we basically propagated that through this Chalcogenide waveguide, and we compared how much dispersion there was with and without the waveguide, and we saw very little. We basically we had only a 10 femtosecond error. It showed that really we, would, we get very little dispersion in these waveguides. And the other key advantage is walk off, because as I said, we're doing a mixing operation where we want to mix the signal with um, a, different, a different wave or a different frequency. So, the important, since the dispersion is wave independent, we need to have phase and group velocity matching between all mixing waves. And so this is the idea of that, and this is, that's the concept of walk-off, where they're propagating with different root velocities due to that dispersion. 
That's, of course, if we want to maximize the interaction, these have to be maintained and temporally aligned in time. We measured, we measured that um, for these waveguides, and we measured the bandwidth um, uh, where we can avoid walk off of about 2.8 terahertz. That's sort of the maximum bandwidth of the signal on the test. So I'll go into now talk about applications of these waveguides. We've got this very, we've got these waveguides which have very low dispersion and um, very high linearity. And now we're going to talk about how we can apply these to real practical examples. And this first technique is going to be an optical sampling oscilloscope. I described the sampling oscilloscope at the beginning of my talk that I used based on electronics. Um, and the limit with that is that electronics is really is limited to working on about a six picosecond um, resolution. So we want to do much better than that. And so that, to do that, we go to using all nonlinear optics. We, we're using all optical spins in the sensor. Now this sampling gate function is not an electrical sampling gate, that's in a conventional sampling scope. It's now an optical um, sampling. We're going to do the mixing, it's not going to be an electrical process, it's going to be a whole optical process in, in this charcoal denied waveguide. So the idea is that we have this pump pulse, we've got our signal, it's a periodic signal, and this pump pulse is going to sample different, we're going to use a mixing operation, we're going to sample different points of the signal, different times, and then we're going to construct a spread out version of this signal, and, and, that's, and that's the optical sampling function. And we're going to use four-way mixing, so we're going to have our pump, um, and we're going to have our signal at different wavelengths, and we're going to generate an idle wave, we filter that out, and we're going to have this sample function. We're going to apply it to very short and high bit rate signals. So this is the system that we, that we use to um, demonstrate that. Um, so we generated, first the key, the challenge of this experiment was generating a pump pulse um, that was short, very short pump pulse um, that we could use as our sampling function. And so in this case we used, a, we used this setup here, we basically had a 10 gigahertz mobile fiber laser, which needed about 2 picosecond pulses. And then we used some compression techniques in fiber using nonlinear effects. Compress that down to uh, about 500, 510 femtoseconds. That was going to be our optimal sampling gate function. And then we launched that into this chalk night waveguide where the sampling and mixing operation takes place. So for the signal under test, we, we use it, oh, sorry, that was, that was the um, pump there signal, sorry. But it's basically the same. We're using a pump in the 10 gigahertz mobile laser and we're using a compression process in fiber as well. It's more or less the same. So, this is um, on the, we have our signal on the left, which is uh, 520 femtoseconds pulse, and our pump is um, 510 femtoseconds. So they both go into the waveguide, and, um, yeah, they, so yeah, the pump power was 12 watts coupled into that waveguide. And so this is the sample pulse that we generated um, by, this, by this technique. Um, we measured a pulse width of 685 femtoseconds. That, um, that was just due broader than what was, what was originally made, just due to spurting in the fires um, going to the uh, waveguide. And we generated a high signal to noise ratio. And this resolution was 446 femtoseconds, well beyond the capabilities of what we do by electronic sampling techniques. And then we want to see, apply this to a real signal. This is a real communication. Um, signal is a very high bit rate signal, a 640 gigabit um, time domain vision multiplex signal. It's very, um, using very short pulses, and the idea is this, this is what the transmitter for this signal looks like. So we take a 40 gigahertz um, laser, that's a million pulses at 40 gigahertz repetition, they are 2 picoseconds wide, and we use compression to compress it down to 500 picoseconds. And the reason why we have to compress is that we're going to interleave these pulses with the time domain. We need these pulses at 640 gigabits. We need these pulses to be shorter than a bit period, and that, that bit period is only one picosecond. So there's two picoseconds and one minute. So we have to compress it to less than that, and then we then we apply then we modulate um, the information from that pulse train, and then we enter in this multiplexing stage. And then we just try sampling that signal. Here's the autocorrelation and the spectrum of that signal. 
So this is the spectrum at the output of the waveguide. On the left we have the signal going into the uh, waveguide, and this is the pump, which is that 510 per second pulse. So and then by forward mixing we get this um, little hump here, which is the eye. And so we filter that out, and then we will have our sampling function. And here, this is what we observe. So this is an eye diagram. Um, an eye diagram is basically, now we're not working with the pulse train anymore. We've got a data pattern, which has um, it's a pseudo-random data pattern of um, pulses. So a logic zero, there's no pulse, and when there's a, a logic one, there is a pulse. And we basically take that pattern and wrap it up. We have what's called an eye diagram. So we can see the zero level and the one level. So that was what we did in our lab. What's the, what's the record of the literature? What's, what's the highest resolution that the standard of the up to a sample? And this is um, the experiment, um, to best my knowledge, that's been demonstrated. And that was a 280 per second um, demonstrated by a Japanese group uh, in 2004. And they used that to, to measure a 640 signal. It's very similar. There's no, basically, the basic concept is no different. They're basically generating a very short um, pump pulse. In this case, they generate 210 per second pulses at quite a long wavelength. And then they, and the only difference now, they're not using a child hydrogen waveguide, they're using a periodic control with the NIDA, using the high 2 normal and The concept is the same, so they combine it with their signal, um, the pump and the signal through their waveguide, they detect the samples and then process the signal. But the real challenge is really about generating this um, pump source for, uh, to, to do the same thing. Generating 210 per seconds is really challenging. So there's another challenge with this. Whenever we do these nonlinear mixing processes, we also have to be aware of um, uh, polarization uh, dependence. These, uh, in, the, in the optimum case, where both the signal and the pump will be color polarized, and our fiber can support two polarization states. Um, so, we, in, a, in a real situation where you may not have the signals going into the waveguide co polarized. And so, one, and then, so, there's different schemes how we can make these schemes polarization diverse, diverse so they're polarization independent. And here's, here's two simple examples. Basically, the idea is that the signal and the pump are combined. And this is, in this case, the, the mixing is done in a higher on the fiber. And now there is a piece of polarization maintaining fiber, sorry. Um, polarization maintaining fiber, which um, essentially adds, has a very high fire fringes. So that creates, if the signal and the pump are launched on different polarization states, and that creates uh, this, this um, delay between them. And if we combine them, um, the idea is that now we, we adjust the polarization of the pump so that it's launched into both polarization states of this um, polarization maintaining fiber so that half the pump appears um, on different polarization states but with a delay between them. So now whatever the signal polarization is, it comes into this piece of polarization maintaining fiber, it's guaranteed that half, some portion may be on this, or either this part of the pump or on this pump. And so then we will have some um, polarization dependence in this part. So I'll go into the next um, example. So the, the other uh, technique that we looked at is uh, measuring the waveform spectrum. As I introduced in the beginning of my presentation, um, we're, we're looking at measuring the intensity spectrum of pulses. And uh, this, this is the electric field of the pulse, which um, this is this 325 and a second pulse here. And we want to measure, um, as I said, we can, we can use the fog technique to characterize this um, system in amplitude and phase. But we also, we're also interested in just being able to characterize the intensity of these pulses, the profile, intensity profile. And that's where, what can come out of this waveform spectrum. That's what we define as a waveform spectrum. It's the Fourier transform of the intensity of the pulse. As, as opposed to the optical spectrum, which is a Fourier transform of the electric field of the pulse, which I'll go there. So the traditional way to measure that is um, to use a photo detector and a spectrum analyzer. So um, the photo detector converts electric field to intensity, and then the spectrum analyzer we can um, see what that spectrum is. 
So this is used, this is very powerful technique used. Uh, we can use that to uh, measure the jitter of optical signals. Because um, if we consider a sine wave signal, if there's any jitter on that sine wave, you know, it's intensity spectrum. If one appears as a delta function, as in the idle case, but I'll have these lobes here, and that's, that's due to this time of jitter. So we want to measure this intensity spectrum of this pulse. Now, for, if we're going to measure very short pulses, then this photo detector, we, we need a much broader band capability. So that's where this anomaly optics comes in again. And we can do, and if we can measure this spectrum, then we can do some interesting characterization of these pulses. Here's an example of measuring dispersion of a pulse, where we can see as we disperse a pulse, this intensity spectrum on the right changes, but the optical spectrum doesn't, because that's the electric field, which doesn't conceal the phase. So then we can take advantage of another um, feature of the um, intensity spectrum, and that's this minor kinship field, which basically says that the um, waveform spectrum of signal is equal to the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, which is given by that. So if we have the intensity spectrum of the signal, then if we take an inverse Fourier transform, we should be able to get um, autocorrelation. So that's what we implemented use in the, and this is a technique that we investigated in our lab, and that was using this optical chip to generate this waveform spectrum, which we could then use to produce an autocorrelation. And I'll explain how this technique works. So the idea is that we have our signal under test, and we can, which is going to act as a pump of hallway mixing. We combine it with a CW laser, so spectrum, the input spectrum into this chip looks like this. We've got our signal on the left, and we combine it with the CW laser, and we're using this cross-fade modulation effect. So where now the, this pulse, the intensity of this pulse has changed in the refractive index of this waveguide. So this, this now, the CW laser sees this refractive index modulated in proportion to the intensity of this pulse. That creates these um, phase modulation, which translates to frequency modulation in this CW laser. So mathematically, I'll just go through it quickly. On the top right, we have the electric field of the probe. Uh, after cross-phase modulation, the phase is modulated by this complex term and, and in proportion to the intensity of the signal, whatever it is. Now consider the case where, uh, the, consider a Taylor series expansion of this um, phase term here, this additional. Now consider that this phase term is um, very small, much less than one, so we've got a weak phase modulation. We can approximate this Taylor series to the first two terms, so we can see that the probe electric field now becomes proportional to the intensity. And so if we take the Fourier transform of that, we see that now the optical spectrum given by the Fourier transform of the electric field of the probe is now proportional to the intensity spectrum of the, of the signal I detect. So we've, we've generated the RS spectrum in the optical domain without having to use a high speed probe to take the electric electron. So we, we demonstrate this um, using this chip, we want to test, and we know this chip is broadband and should be able to handle very short frequency pulses. We want to see if this technique is capable of um, surely measuring such short pulses. So we used a, um, a Modoc laser uh, to generate two two second pulses, and then we used some nonlinear compression in fibre to generate a 200 per second pulse. This is what uh, the pulse at the output of that pipe looked like. It had this complicated spectrum here, and in time domain it had this, um, it was a 390 second pulse. So then we put it into this waveguide and we looked at the cross phase modulation. We, this is the probe's signal, the probe, and we generate this cross phase modulation side band here. And we took, extracted that side band, and we can see it's band from zero to three terahertz frequency after converting from wavelength to frequency. And then we took that inverse Fourier transform, making use of that minor kinship theorem. We took the inverse Fourier transform and we retrieved the autocorrelation trace shown in the blue there. We want to see how good, how good is that to use a standard autocorrelated system. So we compared them and we measured both the autocorrelation from the standard autocorrelator and we got a really good bit with an error of just a few terms of fantasy seconds. So being able to measure this autocorrelation function gives some nice capabilities for um, performance monitoring. You can use a chip-based 
you can actually realize a chip based performance monitor using bio analyzing the order correlation function. Performance monitoring is it's quite a, it's an important topic in optical communications, for example. Here's an example of a different technique using that such as delayed tap sampling. The basic idea is that this is an eye dry analysis signal, as I explained before. Different, different effects distort this eye diagram in different ways, like noise appears as um, can close this eye, dispersion broadens the pulses, and, um, polarization mode dispersion distorts pulses, crosstalk, and then we combine all these effects together, we have quite a large distortion. So we're interested in being able to distinguish this kind of distortion. The autocorrelation can do the same. If we consider this uh, three cases of dispersion, noise, and time jitter, this is the red function is the ideal autocorrelation of the undistorted signal. And then now, and above is the RS spectrum case. Now, but they're both related by one line of tension here. We consider dispersion. Dispersion will broaden the pulses, so the autocorrelation pulses will simply broaden in both the autocorrelation and these are the cross correlation pulses. They will simply broaden. Noise logically causes a shift, in, increase in the background level. The time jitter doesn't change the autocorrelation function because they're still autocorrelating the same pulse for itself. The cross correlation does broaden. So we can distinguish kind of different impairments using the um, order by studying the autocorrelation function. With this chip capability, we can, um, we can uh, implement this on a chip, and that's what research we're looking at. So, I summarize, just to summarize, I gave you uh, an overview of how normally optics can be used um, for categorizing very, very short pulses on the first second or out second scale. I've just got two techniques, autocorrelation, frequency resolve, baby. I talked about developing an optical sampling stack. This is, um, this is using all optical mixing um, in this, in this chip-based way to achieve resolution of about 450 seconds. But it is also capable of much um, shorter. Um, and I also described this waveform spectrum analyzer, which has a multi-terrorist bandwidth, and we can use that to measure the manipulation of very short pulses. Uh, so, in my next talk, I'm going to be talking about um, a diff totally different area. It's going to be talking about the optical um, high bandwidth communications. And, yeah, so I'll look at that. Then, in that case, and uh, see you back here a bit later for.